and they have been falling. They keep falling. It's that kills the confidence. Not to mention because you, you and I both know when you have a fixed nominal debt balance, but the asset price that's tethered to declines, so you start going underwater. Yeah, that's very crippling, and I think it's showing in China. Hence, they're very cautious of taking out new debt right now. And when they're not taking out new debt, they're not consuming because when you take out credit, you're essentially consuming now, right? And you pay it off in the future. You keep hopefully rolling it over. Hopefully, your asset prices increase, or you can get a lower interest rate, refinance, etc. But in China, yeah, they're they're really the con- the consumer there is really struggling, and if the asset prices keep falling. You have debt. Def- there's a term called debt deflation, which was by Irving Fisher. He was an economist. You guys probably heard about him. He he was the one in 1929 who made the famous thing that U.S. stocks have reached a new plateau. They'll like never go down again. And then the entire market blew up. And but he was a very smart economist. And I actually give him credit because he went back and realized like, holy hell, I was wrong. And he reshaped his thesis on everything, and he adapted it to the Great Depression. And he came up with a term called debt deflation. And he said, that's what happens when you have asset prices get clobbered and the nominal debt terms are the same. He said, it's very deflation because everybody has to sell. There's a rush for cash. Like nobody wants to take out new debt. No one's taking out new debt. The banks stall, you know, consumption stalls, unemployment rises. So he said, it's a vicious feedback loop of deleveraging. And I think China's literally at that door right now. So I didn't mean to go on for such a long rant. No, I mean, absolutely, without a doubt. I mean, that, that was definitely a good way to open the show, you know. And, you know, again, it's, <laughs> you know, again, you know, people usually speak of China as, you know, fastest growing economy in the world, which which it has been, okay. And, you know, I know my friend here on Clubhouse, Lindsay, you know, she's always on Chinese and she's always on China's nuts, man, hyping them up all the time, right. China's the best place to conduct business, bop, 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 bop. But, I mean, you know, I don't think people really understand these um, these um, issues surrounding China right now. And, of course, you know, the, the citizens within China itself. Now, the problem is China's so big that, you know, an economic meltdown within China would have a huge effect on the rest of the planet. That's That's the other issue. Okay? I mean, we can go back to seen what happened during the COVID era, right? When COVID first broke out in China and, you know, they had the whole zero COVID policy. I mean, it sent shockwaves across the planet, right? And, of course, thinking about what's to happen if, you know, this situ of deflation isn't, you know, handled by the government, which I'm pretty sure it cannot be, by the way. I mean, every single solution that I've looked at, you know, has no... um. I mean, there's no happy ending, right? And, you know, again, it's, I I don't know, Adam. (laughs) I don't know how these guys get out of it. I mean, you've got, you know, what, quantitative easing. um, You've got reforming the uh, hukou system. I actually got that from you, by the way, the last conversation we had. I mean, I I really can't think of any possible solutions that, that don't have a negative effect on the rest of the planet. Okay, so, um, you know, one thing I definitely want to talk about right now, though, um, I definitely want to highlight, you know, some of the negative impacts um, that we we could see, you know, given what's going on in China right now. So on a positive side, from a from a deflation perspective, you know, this could, in fact, benefit consumers in the short term, because essentially when it's deflation, you're the purchasing power of your money increases. Right. So the average consumer is able to purchase more with the same amount of money. Right. But on a negative side of things, and this is, you know, again, when we're talking about consistent uh, deflation, it can lead to a spiral where people hold off on spending in anticipation of further price decreases, which reduces demand. And if you're reducing demand in a deflationary economy, it leads to more deflation. Right for the lack of a better term. And aside from that, you know, the impact deflation has on debt, right? As prices drop, the relative value of debt increases. And then I think the most significant one to me, um, because this essentially has a domino effect, is the fact that businesses may face lower profits due to decreasing prices, decreasing prices due to, 
you know, reduction in demand, which would lead to cutbacks or closures, and of course, higher unemployment rates. And China right now, its youth unemployment is, I mean, Lord have mercy. It's like, those, <laughs> I was talking with Jonathan today. We were talking about the uh, China youth unemployment. I was like, bro, those guys just want to kick back and play some goddamn Bitcoin because they're not working, <laughs> okay? But then at the same time, it may be because, you know, there, there aren't, you know, available opportunities. Who knows? So what we're going to be talking about in this conversation, of course, we're going to be talking about, um, you know, the implications for the global economy. We're going to be talking about recent trends, you know, regarding China. You know, I think the biggest one for me is this GDP over the past couple of years, um, rising debt, um, and a lot more in this particular conversation, right? So as of right now, I'm putting together a thread on this particular topic. It's just taking me a little bit of time for me to finish. And then I'm going to post it up top for you guys to take a look at that. But um, that being said, before I toss this back to Adam, I mean, if fine, you or anybody else in the room. Matter of fact, let me ask you guys a question. If you guys knew all of this about China, all of this and more, of course, because we're going to be discussing this a lot more. If you guys knew all this prior to this conversation, put a one in the chat right now. If you guys had no idea China was actually going through any nonsense, put a two in the chat right now. One in the chat if you had an idea about this. Two in the chat if you knew absolutely nothing was going on with China. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. What are, okay. what are they saying? I mean, you do have a lot of people with twos in the chat, right? There's a couple people in here who thought it was all good and gravy in China. Uh, yeah. I, I, you I, know? It's, it's the thing with the China. There's this one economist. His name's Michael Pettis, and he actually is in China. He has phenomenal books. Highly recommend all of them. The Great Rebalancing, The Volatility Machine, Trade Wars or Class Wars. He, he's been so damn. I, I read his first book when I was in college. And I just remember looking at it and I was like, wow, like this is so different to what I'm learning in, in class. I even brought it up to my teacher and, and he was saying the same thing to me. He was like, no, China has a huge uh, consumption base, like all this stuff, like same with India. And it's like 10 years later, nine years later now, I'm looking at them and it's just like, damn, like, you know, like my professors were wrong. Like this other guy was totally on point. And his main thesis was, when you were China, he was like, it, so there's a thing called the Gershenkron growth model. And we saw the USSR do it. We saw the Nazis do it. We saw Brazil in the 50s, 60s do it. Uh, Japan did it. And in short, it's when you are trying to hyper grow your economy at the beginning, you reduce consumption. Because like I said earlier, if you're not spending, you're saving. And when you save and you're not a developed market yet, you have to depend on domestic savings or you have to depend on hedge fund money coming in. But as fast as it comes in, we all know like the Mexican tequila crisis and uh, you know, the early nineties and Thailand and Indonesia, when all that hot money comes in, it'll boost up your economy, but it can easily be yanked out. Right. And it crushes your economy. So these people, instead, they wanted to source the money domestically. Uh, USSR it's called the Leninist uh, imperialist model. That was like the original, person he did it and so yeah the the ussr for example they one of their biggest exports to the nazis when they had their bilateral trade agreements in the 1930s it was grains and wheat and rubber and commodities guess what in the same time millions millions of russians and ukrainians especially were starving to death and it just shows you how these countries will literally take the goods to export them to raise the reserves meaning their own capital so they can build up their industrial base now china didn't do it to that extent but it just shows you how they will steal from their workers and china is doing that today i mean that's the only reason they're so competitive is that they're they're producing more than their wages have gone up whereas in like the u.s we're a very high wage driven economy in china it's a very high savings economy so when they're saving more they have more, the state enterprise banks have more capital to deploy an infrastructure. In the early 2000s, this made some sense, right? I mean, China was very underinvested. But now you get to a point where how many more bridges can you build? How many more ghost cities can you build to prop up GDP, right? How many more train, railroads, fixed asset investment? How much more can you build without hitting the law of diminishing returns. And we all know that's inescapable. You will always hit the law of diminishing returns. And China started hitting that in 2018. And 
their debt exploded through the roof at the same time. And the thing is, when the debt ratio starts increasing, because the theory is, if your GDP to debt is increasing, that means you're spending more on debt relative to GDP growth. Otherwise, it wouldn't match, right? Every dollar in investment gives you a dollar in GDP. You wouldn't see the ratio widen. But China's has been widening significantly. I mean, look at any chart of their debt, private sector debt, public. Uh, their public debt's not too bad, actually, but uh, local government debt, uh, you know, uh, business debt, bank debt. It's, it's gone like, it's just over the last 15 years, it's gone straight up. And the problem is private debt can't rise forever. You get to a point where you're a bank or an individual, your wages have to justify it. So in America, what the U.S. does, our wages sure as hell don't justify our spending. Hence, credit is so lax. But the U.S. promotes a high demand economy. You know, we have the 30-year fixed mortgage. We're the only country in the world that has that. And that's a massive asset to have, right? Like locking in a 30-year loan at a pretty low interest rate. I mean, that's, I mean, I don't think people realize, like, that's a huge boon to have. You have Social Security. You have welfare, Medicare, Medicaid, right? You have all these programs, and not even including state, local governments like food stamps, et cetera. They do things to promote consumption, essentially to keep you spending. And that's the opposite of what China does. They have no safety nets. So when you have individual saving, and they have a huge demographic cliff, they're saving for future healthcare costs, right? Because when you get older and you're retiring, not to mention they have the one-child policy. Most of the countries, if you look right now with the highest fertility rates, it's essentially Africa and because they have no uh, so social safety nets. So you have to have more children, just like in the old days in the America, 1800s, you would have more children to work for you when you retired. You know, they would mill the farm and the rural properties, et cetera. As you get more developed, the fertility rate starts declining. In fact, I think the U.S., in 220 years of U.S. data, this has gone back, we've only seen one period where the fertility rate rose in a cyclical upstream. And it was the baby boom, 1946 to 1964. It's the only time we saw fertility rate actually start increasing. And China essentially neutered themselves with their one child policy for, for decades. Now they reversed it recently, I think last year or six months ago. They said, okay, you can have up to two or three kids now. But it's like the damage is done because that will take decades to play out. Adam, that damaged the hell out of me. Adam, there's a couple of things I want you to address. Yeah, I want you to address to the crowd uh, when you mentioned ghost cities. Can you explain what ghost cities are? Yeah, because I thought that was crazy uh, when I saw them. And, you know, Nelson and I were, we were, we were on the uh, phone speaking, you know, about this uh, China then and deflation and the uh, youth unemployment and things of that nature. And I started bombarding him with, like, all kinds of rankings because China, in terms of production, you know, you know, they, they produce more than anyone in any, I mean, they, they're producing everything. It's pretty much an export society. So it's like it, they made up their mind at some point that they were going to produce everything. And as long as it was geographically feasible, they did it, you know, in terms of pineapples, tomatoes, whatever, where, where, you know, they where they were like pretty much not producing any of this, they now produce the biggest supply in the world, or either their first, second, third, or fourth. When they were down like 50 or uh, 100 someplace uh, some, in some uh, instances, they're massively producing. They, they're producing more automobiles than anyone else. They're, doing, uh, they're producing just at, at, a, at a rate that is just astronomical. And so uh, how does this play in that, that current situation uh, as well? Real yeah. quick, Adam, before you go ahead, um, I just want to let everybody know, if you're on Twitter, scroll all the way to the top of the page and dive into the thread that I just posted that should give you a, um, pretty much an overview on this particular conversation and what's going on in China right now. So that's for you guys on Twitter. Just scroll all the way to the top of the page, hit that thread, and just start start smashing it. Start going through it. You got 14 tweets of detailed information there. For you guys on Clubhouse, same thing. I just pinned it to the very top of the page. Hit the link at the top of the page and dive into that. Adam, let's do it. Yeah, no, uh, Jonathan brings up a really good point. So just to touch on his first thing, ghost city. So China's GDP was around 30% dependent on construction, like a property sector, uh, property development. Obviously, it's a huge boon, right? The construction needs, uh, I mean, you guys work in real estate, and you, you realize how much demand and products, everything that goes into commodities, et cetera, goes into building homes. And it was fueling growth for them, about 30% of their GDP, 25, 30%. Problem is, they were overbuilding, and they're pretty shoddy quality. But the thing that's interesting about the ghost city is a lot of them are owned, but no one was living in them. 
And it just goes back to what I was saying earlier. They In China, they don't have many options for investment. One, they can't really take their money out of the country. I mean, you, you can, but you have to get it approved. There's limits, et cetera. Uh, it's a closed capital account in China. It's not like in America or the UK where you could just say, hey, why are my whatever $5 million to uh, whatever Panama or whatever you want to do, right? You know, no bank's going to say, no, we need approval. You know, if you, if you want a suitcase full of cash, then yeah, but if you're just doing an online deposit, go for it. China, you can't do that. Um, people try to smuggle money out of Hong Kong. They do under invoicing, which has become a big problem, uh, et cetera. But the point is, so when people had all limited investments and savings opportunities, bank NIMS, bank returns were pretty weak. They have uh, wealth management products, which are, I mean, they're pretty much like a Ponzi scheme, more or less, in China. But they were buying these apartments or condos or whatever. Most of them are just skyscrapers, not really suburban homes. And they were just sitting on them. Like, no one lives in them, but they're just using it as a vehicle. So that individual, what they're like, hey, when I end up retiring, I'm going to sell this property, have the cash, and live. The thing is, they overbuilt, and then demand started stalling, mainly because asset prices, because China started trying to crack down on it, which I don't blame them, because uh, their property sector was big, uh, very big, and very over leveraged. And they started something in 2018, early 19, uh, called the Three Red Lines. And they were forcing property makers. I'm sure you've all heard of like Evergrande and Evergrande, whatever it is called. Um, they got smackled. Yeah, yeah. So China basically told them the three red lines were essentially you have to cut your debt, raise more cash. Essentially, they were telling them to deleverage. They were like, you need to get more comfortable. Thing is, anytime you tell a company, especially a property builder, to deleverage, I mean shed assets. That you right, and you and if you're telling all of them to do it at the same time, that's the you know, fallacy of composition right there that all these economies run into. If one or two people, one company starts deleveraging or one household starts paying down debt, that's a good thing. But if everyone does it at the same time, that's a fire sale, right? That's debt deflation. So that's kind of like the paradox. And um, that's what happened with Chinese property sector. They tried to rein in the debt. The problem is you can't rein in the, the property sector without curbing your GDP unless you're subsidizing it somewhere else. So China kind of reversed it. They did this year um, after seeing how they were trying to get asset prices to go back up now, which is just going to put them in a bigger problem later. But they were like, all right, we don't want to have lower growth, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, to, and to Jonathan's second point, yeah, China, if anyone hasn't seen uh, China's auto exports, you, you got to look at that chart. It, it's honestly remarkable. Over the last three years, Chinese autos exports have exploded they just surpassed uh japan i believe they're going to overtake germany or it might be the other way around it, they surpassed one of the two major auto manufacturers recently within three years and it, it is a problem because china is doubling down on the supply side they're just trying to export more to get their growth because they can't get it internally and that's a problem because it kind of forces these goods on the rest of the world and it is deflationary they're essentially exporting this deflation I mean, it goes through supply chains and everything, so it's not as much. But still, when you're pumping a ton of manufactured goods into the world, um, you know, it's going to weigh down prices. That's why um, in 2015, when China devalued their currency, their shock devaluation, markets everywhere plunged because they were, everyone was like, oh, shit, this is going to be extremely deflationary. And China's yuan right now is even lower than back then. Um, you know, they're trying to protect it now or at least try to stabilize it. But it just shows the lack of confidence in their economy. And it's it's very imbalanced. They have to try to unwind it. So the, the best way they could do this, they would have to let GDP fall and increase their household share of GDP, meaning subtract from the investment side. Because it always equals out at like, you know, 100. Essentially, it's a, it has to equal out. Like you take from investment, it has to go to household or government somewhere um, else. So the idea is you could let them cut their investment share of GDP and it's essentially a wealth transfer to the households. But China, to do that, it would be very painful. I mean, that's not something you could do overnight, right? You, you have to, just giving out people checks isn't gonna really do anything until you increase their share of household consumption of GDP. So they would have to essentially, historically it happens with a big crash, like 1929 was a big one. You had to let GDP fall, let's say 30%, but then household income only declined 15%. So, you know what I mean? So you're kind of rebalancing that way. Historically, it would come from big crashes, Brazil, same thing, 
or you could do what Japan did. They don't have a crash or a big crash, and they just kind of lull along for the next 30 years. Adam, Japan, uh, Japan was uh, at one point in time, we looked at Japan the same way uh, we're looking at China, but not as adversaries, but in terms of their economy. They, yeah, I don't know if you remember back in the 90s and, you know, they're buying up everything and, you know, Sony and all, it's just huge. And then all of a sudden, it's just, they, they it kind of went to shit. I mean, they were saying that they were going to surpass us. Uh, is that sort of what's happening here with China right now? One. Yeah. Hundred and I'm, I'm I'm glad you brought that up, right? No, a really good point. Uh, just you know, to, I mean, I wasn't around back then. I, I mean, I was born in the early '90s, but uh, you know, like, well, I, you're, I you guys, you guys are it. off by a decade, and it's not the same story. Who is this? Somebody Who is this? Wrong. Me right well, late here. '80s. Well, late well 80s no, it's the actually the mid '80s. The, as I said, the 80s, 90s, bro. That's why I said the well, 80s, Well, no, 90s. it wasn't the 90s. That's my point. Yeah, it was the 90s because they were still feeling the, the, the effects of it into the 90s. They weren't booming in the 90s. That's my point. No, well, no. What, what I said, it crashed in the 90s. I, I mean, it, it crashed. And yeah, then, 91. And they were feeling the effects into the 90s. They right. felt but it it's for, not, for a while. It's not a parallel example. You can't use Japan and China the same way. Because it wasn't. I run your mouth. Yeah, you, you absolutely can. No, it's one hundred. It's, it's not the let, same. Let's hear what he has to say. Let's hear what he has to say. Because then we have yeah we have Adam up here. Let, so, let's let's do it. So the, yeah, I mean, re- wait 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 wait. Sl- sl- slow down. Slow down. Okay. Um, and listen, man. This, 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 I appreciate the pushback, but you know, we got to run a show. It's a lot of people trying to learn. Japan's lost decade, right? Japan's lost decade seems pretty much like a parallel to what's going on in China right now. Not at all. China's literally flowing in the exact same direction. I, I'm telling jump, you. Jump in. Yeah. So Let us know what you think. So think about what, what China had done in terms of its transformation starting in the 90s. Um, the point was made that there was a massive amount of capital investment, infrastructure, real estate. That's all very, that's all very obvious, all very clear. So Japan's boom was a byproduct of the expansion purely – of industrial, both mid-grade and high-grade exports. So autos, electronics, et cetera, et cetera. They expanded their presence globally, so the presence wasn't just located in, 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 in Japan. It became multinational or global. The presence of U.S. automakers, uh, sorry, in, in U.S. territory in terms of automakers, Sony, et cetera. So it was a massive global expansion. That's not at all what happened with China, and that's not at all what's going on with China, right? This is a export driven economy that was resource intensive. They continue to expand all based on debt. So think of it as a massive CapEx boom to facilitate what they thought was going to eventually be. And they articulated this about a decade ago, a transition to the consumer. So the model that China had followed was this idea that if they expand manufacturing, industrial capacity, infrastructure, That once they filled that and they became primarily an export economy, they could then convert convert to a domestic or inward-looking consumer-based economy, not all that different than the U.S., okay? The problems are political and social in nature. One, you don't have anywhere near the same conversion from an industrial manufacturing to a domestic consumer-based economy. And two, the politics of Xi. Go back and study what happened, started happening in 2012 when they started cracking down on corruption. And look at the path the government has taken. It's only recently accelerated, but it was all discussed in the last seven years. China's changed its trajected growth. It's changed its policy in terms of consumption, and it's changed its path of expansion. This resembles nothing like Japan. So Japan had always terrible corporate governance. They've always had um, a terrible perspective on expansion. The way that the Japanese, you guys mentioned, buying everything from Pebble Beach to Rockefeller Center was, was both currency-related and economic-driven. And then, of course, the eventual collapse, but a lot of it wasn't entirely the same functionality of leverage, although leverage is part of it. So the parallels are there in terms of rapid expansion. The conversion are not the same the industries that led it are not the same. The political dynamics are not the same. The only kind of sort of parallel is the homogeneous population and then, of course, the eventual declining birth rate. That's about it. 
but I wouldn't make, I would not use this as an analog. I would not use Japan as an analog. Yeah, Jerome, I, I, uh, I'm a fan of your work and I respect your thing, but I, I don't, I, 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 the parallels are pretty clear. I mean, in my opinion, excluding what they were even exporting, the end matters was they were running current account surpluses, right? Japan's current account surplus or the exports share of GDP, it hit like 12, 15% in 1985, I believe. And then Reagan, you know, the Plaza Accord, they made them increase their, you know, their currency, obviously them in West Germany at the time because of the unfair trade advantages. Same thing we were seeing today. America was sick of absorbing their access at our manufacturing capacity. In the same time, when the yen increased, their household debt to GDP soared. We saw the same thing with China post-2008. Their household debt to GDP went up from about 25, now it's 63, and essentially since 2019 stalled from a stronger currency. And then it popped their asset bubble. And what China and Japan tried, there was a famous, the old central banker of Japan, um, Makawa, uh, Huzuko, Makawa, I might be butchering his name. He came up with the Makawa Commission, and they told in that commission to the prime minister, they said, we need to rebalance from a supply side export economy to demand driven. But the special interests and the government subsidies were so entrenched in the Liberal Party in Japan, they wouldn't rebalance. So it just lulled along for the next 30 years running chronic account surpluses depending right. on exports. And China's done the same thing. But you didn't have, first of all, you didn't have the expansion of you didn't have the infrastructure expansion you didn't have the housing expansion that was state-led the expansion of consumer-led debt now th that has some nuances to it because to your point it's right wealth is perceived on the ownership of real estate primarily that that wasn't the case of japanese in the 80s secondarily the ever expansion of real estate right the 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 need to expand the ownership of real estate is for the most part the expansion of leverage at the consumer level. This wasn't a consumer that was taking on excess credit card debt, excess bank debt in the form of owning other assets. This was primarily housing led, right? If you look at the top quartile, or I should say the top half. So, and then politically, this is a centrally planned government, very different than Japan in the 80s, in terms of what the provinces were allowed to do, what the government was supporting, and you had a definitive change about 10 years ago in the path of the government. So the moment the government decided to change its path 10 years ago, even though they talked about this consumer-driven approach, the moment they started to crack down on corruption, the moment they started to crack down on the involvement of U.S. companies and can the, the, the transparency in IP, the transparency on trade, all this kind of stuff, like that is very different than Japan, right? I mean, th th these things are, there's similarities, but I don't think it's an analog. I, I don't see it. I mean, social dynamics are different. Political dynamics are different. Economic dynamics are very different. Uh, uh, we, we, can, we can see another massive difference, which is military presence. Japan had none. Trying, yeah, I, 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 th I think we're arguing s s semantics here. I, listen, I'm not trying to talk about Japan, okay? One one common denominator between both of these um, economies in relation to the actual conversation, we're talking about rapidly expanding economies, and how that's had that had a negative impact on Japan, and how that's currently having a negative impact on China. In the conversation, okay, this is not a conversation about fucking. But, but Japan. there's a lot of ex trying to rapidly expanding government government. governments. Pre pre appreciate. Thank you very much. Go, go to the good. Go to the good. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So. <laughs> Adam, Adam, um, real quick, one thing I definitely want us to do, I want us to go back to the beginning, okay? I want us to talk about, you know, the um, the shift, right, from a centrally planned economy to a market-oriented economy by um, the then leader of China. I don't know if you call him leader or prime minister, whatever it is, Deng Xiaoping. Do you know what I'm talking about, Adam? Yeah, from the 70s, 80s. Yes, because that was what that was what turned China into the monster that we all know it to be now. He made some changes, okay? So, you know, Deng Xiaoping, for you guys that don't know, this guy came into power in the late 70s, I believe, late 70s, early 80s or so. And, you know, he essentially introduced, you know, substantial, I mean, just substantial economic reforms that essentially restructured China's, you know, 
entire economic fabric, like literally restructured it. And his ultimate objective was the modernization of China's industry. Okay, everything from agriculture to defense, technology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And his key target areas, I believe, if I'm, if I'm missing something, Adam, just correct me. National defense, agriculture, science, and technology. Okay, and he also introduced a unique model. And, you know, I think the best way of describing this is socialism with Chinese characteristics, okay? Essentially promoting market practices and private enterprise within a socialist framework, right? Which was completely different in comparison with how China had been navigating the waves prior to this guy getting, gaining power. Um, Adam, am I, am I on point so far? Have I missed anything so far? Am I good? No, you, I mean, uh, yeah, that's pretty much what, what they were doing. Okay. And so the shift from, you know, a centrally planned economy to a market-oriented one, again, this guy, Deng, you know, came in, you know, with the aim of reducing state control of the economy and essentially leading to a mixed system that included state, private enterprises, and, of course, uh, both of those departments collect, uh, coming together, right, and collaborating with each other. And, you know, in 1980 or in the early 80s, this guy established um, what they call special economic zones. And, you know, certain regions in China, I think the most popular one being in Shenzhen. And these essentially served as experimental areas for more, you know, liberal economic policies and reforms. And, you know, with the open door policy, I think it's called the open door policy, this is where he essentially opened China up to foreign investment and encourage entrepreneurship, right? So, I mean, this one guy literally changed the socioeconomic fabric of China. Like, this one guy literally started the process um, to which China utilized to become the beast that it is today in the global economy, okay? So, he essentially reversed Mao's... Um, you guys know who Mao is? Put a one in the chat if you know who Mao is. Put a one in the chat if you know who Mao is. Fucking biggest murderer in the world. That's a fact. <laughs> right? He essentially reversed Mao's um, policies, right, by opening China up to foreign investment, right? Because this was never done before. And this was against, you know, Mao's ideologies, Okay. That singular move led to a substantial influx of foreign capital and technological advancement, okay? Um, so this dang guy, and of course, I can keep going on and on and on about what this guy did, but this guy solely changed the socioeconomic fabric of the China that we knew then in comparison with the China that we know today, right? Adam, I, I want you to just, just touch on the beginning there. Maybe I, I missed some things or whatever, maybe you can clean that up a little bit for the people, and then we can move forward and talk about, you know, the the early 2000s. Yeah, no, I mean, you pretty much had it right. Um, Mao launched his, uh, what the hell was it called? Uh, great, no, no, that was Lyndon Johnson. It was something great. Oh, the Great Leap Forward. Yeah, that was what it was called. And around, like, 60 million Chinese died, starved to death, most of them. It was horrible, and that was the idea of like communism, you know, it was like a social economic campaign to modernize. It was like the country's agriculture using communism as if they didn't learn from the fucking shit show in the USSR, you know, 30, 40 years earlier. And yeah, it was just, it, it clearly wasn't efficient. It didn't work. Um, his uh, successor realized that they wanted to adapt to a more modern economy you know keep so they kept the ccp obviously still in power that was like the idea um you know that's how taiwan was formed actually the nationalists fought against the nationalist party of china fought against mao they lost in the civil war and they got they essentially hold up in taiwan so that's how taiwan is now it's pretty much the remnants of the old political party of the nationalist the chinese nationalist party and you know, China obviously wants that, thinks it's part of theirs, not not happy about it. 
but they, yeah, they tried to re, you know, grow their economy on the agricultural side. That was the big focus back then. And they moved more into, you know, in the nineties, it was infrastructure and they had a massive population of, um, uh, you know, uh, capable workers. And the thing is, so there's a big theory in economics that the, in the second industrial revolution, in the U.S., it was between 1870 and 1970. is also known as the Great Urbanization, meaning you shift because the U.S. was what 75, 80 percent rural back then. Now it's uh, to urban. Now it's the opposite. I think it's like 15, 20 percent rural, and then you have big uh, urbanization. So that's kind of what they call the uh, second industrial revolution. Yeah, second industrial revolution is the urbanization. Well, China crammed through their second industrial revolution within the last 30 years. And if you look at the data, you can see uh, the population that has switched from rural to urbanization. But the thing is, it's peaked since like 2015, 16. It's essentially peaked. So they pretty much hit their finalized version of the uh, second industrial revolution, third industrial revolution now that we're in post 70s. But they crammed it all in because they were extremely undeveloped uh, during Mao's period. And and I think uh, his... uh, successor realized that so they wanted to keep a state semi quasi system focus on exports uh just you know the same gershon crown growth model like underpay your workers relative to their productivity so you can export the difference so you're essentially stealing from your population giving them less consumer power so you can run a large as the country the ccp communist party could run larger surpluses collecting dollar reserves gold inflows, whatever they wanted, you know, at the time. And they haven't really drifted from that. I mean, I think China's export industry sector today, it's the most subsidized in the world. I think they subsidize it to like 3% of GDP. The U.S.'s is like 0.6. I mean, we do have subsidies, obviously, in America and agriculture, especially. But it's, I mean, China's is, I mean, aggressively subsidized on the supply side, especially their ports and their uh, logistics for shipping. Uh, huge government subsidies. But the thing is, when you're subsidizing the investment side or the business export side, that's essentially a tax on the consumer side, right? Because for them to do it, you're, you have to either run get, get more reserves, meaning you're suppressing consumption, so taxing people uh, relative to their productivity, or you're, yeah, or you're essentially just taking on bigger debt to build up your subsidy sector well china's public debt it hasn't really ballooned that much i mean it, it's gotten there uh but it's not like egregious uh most of their debts in locals or private sector so china's clearly chosen the former and they've really curbed their consumer but the thing is like you get to a point where you hit diminishing returns you can only modernize you can only build so many railroads so much fixed asset investment and that now the returns are essentially zero i mean look at their to put it in perspective, look at their brick and road, I'm sorry, belt and road initiative. Uh, I think 25% of the BRI loans they made, belt road initiative loans, which are all in dollars, by the way, uh, they're in default, essentially. They're, they're like teetering. And the Chinese Import Export Bank, which is the one, there's another bank too, that controls the flows that go out to these countries. Uh, these are very unprofitable infrastructure projects. And, and it's very hard to get revenue from a lot of these. And you know, in China, you can make the argument now they're, I mean, pretty much all their growth right now on the investment side is coming from fixed asset investment of railroads. They're building like an, a massive amount of railroads. And yeah, you can make the argument that they're preparing for a potential war with Taiwan. They want to increase their logistics, but that doesn't mean it'll be a profitable venture for them. But if you look at the private businesses in America, so not the SOEs, not the state-owned enterprises, dude, their business investment, it, it, it's dead. Their, their employment, wage growth, everything dead. And to me, that's a much more telling sign for China's economy, because that's the part of the economy that's not getting the government subsidies. That's not the state-owned enterprises. So you have a bifurcated economy in China. The SEOs are growing. Obviously, if the CCP picks a target, like the U.S. doesn't, you know, you don't see Biden come out and say, uh, we're going to hit 5% GDP this year, right? In China, if they say, we're going to try to hit 5% GDP, if your domestic economy, private economy, not state, anything related to state, I'd say there's probably around one, one and a half percent. That means you need the state side to pick up the slack. And that money is going to go into wasteful infrastructure, whatever they can, just to get the growth going. So 
it's a very bifurcated situation and it's going to be very difficult for them because they have to choose, right? Either we rebalance trying to fix it or we just keep going into the hole we've already dug, keep taking out, you know, more leverage to unprofitable projects. Their banks are very stressed at this point. I mean, bank NIMS in China are terrible. Uh, they're, they're cutting interest rates already, trying to stimulate the borrower. I don't think that's going to do anything uh, to the previous speaker. Um, I do like Jerome and his point of views, but it's very similar to what happened with Japan. They both had very high savings rates. If you cut interest rates, same with Germany, right? Look at all the current account surplus running economies in the world. South Korea, 30% savings rate, GDP. Germany, 30%. Saudi Arabia, 30%. Japan, 30%. China, 45, 50%, right? Because when you're not um, consuming and you're saving more, right? It, it, it That's less domestic demand. Hence, you run a larger current account surplus. And to put in uh, like econ lingo for anyone, let's say a firm in individuals uh, has, a, I don't know, let's, let's just say they have 10,000 and they make an income. They spend 9,000 of it, they save 1,000. That 9,000 that they're spending goes back into circulation, right? You're spending essentially becomes someone else's income. And that one grand you saved, so the 10% left over, goes into banks. And the banks can use it as, you know, for, you know, it's an increased deposit for them. They could use it for collateral to make a loan, a business, et cetera, whatever. But if no one, so what's happening right now in China is if you have a very high savings rate, so 45%, so instead of it being nine and 10, like kind of in the US, where you're saving around 10%, it's less than 10%, but let's just say it is, um, they're saving 45, 50% gross savings to GDP. So that's almost half your income is being saved. And it, the problem is if no one is borrowing, it like, and that's what we're seeing in China. Look at household debt to GDP. No one's borrowing right now because the they, falling asset prices, declining confidence, whatever it is, they the Chinese consumer like Japan does not want to take on more debt. So the central bank essentially cuts interest rates to try to stimulate it, trying to uh, keep that stream of that whatever nine and ten ratio I was saying, or in China, whatever fifty fifty, let's say. Uh, in circulation and it's deflationary but if people are now saving more and the firms are borrowing less which they are in china it keeps rates chronically low and it slows the economy and inflation hence why we're seeing deflation like the businesses are worried why would they borrow to expand capacity when a new, when consumer demand is so anemic this is the same thing with germany and japan their companies are very profitable right but the thing is they're not expanding capacity because there's no um, consumer demand in their economies, right? So what do they do with that savings? Oh, what do you know? They're buying U.S. bonds or they're shipping it abroad or what Germany did. They use the pig nations essentially uh, to offload all this credit because if, if you're not getting investment in your country, that money will flow to places where it's growing. So we saw a Germany. Uh, if anyone looks at the chart, just Google German current account. After they did the Hartz reforms in the early 2000s, Germany's current account surplus has just gone straight up. It's blown through the roof because of their anemic demand relative to their savings or productive capacity. So they're exporting essentially more than they're importing. Oh, I'm sorry. They were exporting more than they were consuming domestically. So all that savings, when you're running these current account surpluses and you're these exporters, you're not investing at home because you're not getting any demand. Same with Japan. Japan's run chronic account surpluses for 30 years, and they were doing huge surpluses uh, pre 1991 also. And that was a problem with the US. They were getting annoyed. They're like, hey, what the hell? We're, you know, you're keeping your currency cheap. You're killing US auto manufacturers, killing manufacturing capacity because we're forced to absorb your inputs. And granted, we had a massive military in Japan during the Reagan administration, obviously, since World War II. So they played more ball compared to what China would do. But Japan obliged. They said, all right, we'll let the yen appreciate. And it popped their bubble. Uh, Germany is offset their savings to the rest of the European nations. I mean, Spain was running pre-2008. Spain was running one of the biggest deficits in the world. At the same time, matching Germany's large current account surplus, right? They always have to match. It, it will, like, uh, balance of payments, like current account surpluses, deficits all over the world, like you always hear about the U.S.'s big deficit. That essentially means China, mostly the BRIC nations who run huge surpluses, Germany, Norway, Netherlands, like a few of them. South Korea, that essentially means they're running surpluses. It always, the aggregate amount will always balance out at zero. And so when you see these other countries running a surplus, that means somewhere else is running a deficit. And yeah, 
that that was kind of the problem. And, and Germany was off shooting that reserves and credit they were getting, sending it to the U.S., sending it to the pig nations, putting them more in debt, um, obviously, because that the savings had to go somewhere. And then when the – but the problem is private debt can't rise forever. So they had to deleverage. Eventually, we saw it in Europe. Now they're just – they've been broken for over a decade since the 2011 uh, pigs crisis. And you have to find other outlets for that money. So the U.S. is kind of now the only economy – out of those three, Eurozone is running current account surplus. Japan is running current account surplus. It dipped into a deficit because of higher oil energy prices, but it's been chronically a surplus for them for decades. China is now running massive current account surpluses. I think their January to February current account surplus was the largest, uh, I'm sorry, January to March was the largest current account surplus they ever ran in nominal terms. And now you're seeing uh, them essentially have to offload it. Sorry, I didn't mean to go on such a long rant. It's all good, bro. It's all good. Absolutely on point, by the way, right? So I guess, you know, at, at this point, you know, it's, you, do you know who I'm, I fear for the most? The African countries that China has exported, you know, it's, you know, it's deflationary, you know, exports to, Right. You have Nigeria, you have, I mean, just so many African countries. They've exported labor, they've exported a bunch of stuff, and they're still doing it, right? Because with the West, you know, America and, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're bigger boys. We're tougher, okay? But you're talking about poor countries who just might get poorer based on the current situation in China. So it's very interesting to think about. And, of course, Adam, I'm going to circle back to you to get your thoughts on that. But um, real quick, just so you guys get an idea of what China is facing right now, because I also attached um, some images to the thread showing some charts. Um, click the link up top if you're on Clubhouse and just look at tweet number one and tweet number two just to get an idea, you know, from a graphical standpoint as to what's going on in China. You guys on Twitter can do the same thing as well. Just scroll all the way to the top of the page and hit that link. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, you're talking about, you know, a country that dominates the global economy in a number of sectors, right? You're talking about the world's largest exporter and the second largest importer of goods, okay? These guys, you know, within a period of, I think they joined, they joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, if I'm correct, 2001. You're talking about a country which in 20 years or 20 some years has expanded like no one has ever seen ever before. Right. Which is again, you know, to an extent why, why we kept on bringing Japan uh, in a previous conversation, because Japan, I mean, had a rapid expansion, of course, not like China, but you know, there are some similarities, right. In just 20 some years, this country has expanded, you know, to heights that we've never seen before. They're the world's largest exporter second largest import of goods. They're the world's largest manufacturing output, okay? They, I mean, they dominate the electronics industry. They dominate the machinery industry. They dominate the textile industry, the technology industry. Well, uh, green energy, I mean, freaking, it, it's, it's crazy, okay? So how does a country go Agriculture. from a pl Yeah, absolutely. How does a country go from a place of dominance to essentially facing a deflation threat unlike any other in the global economy, right? And, of course, you know, I think, I think Adam, we should highlight, you know, current economic challenges facing China right now, right? And I'm just going to quickly run through this, and I, and I want us to dive into, you know, each of these points, okay? You know, the GDP growth rate of China, economic slowdown, okay? This has been slowing down. Okay, and, you know, I think, you know, I can relate this to what uh, Adam was saying earlier in regards to the law of diminishing returns. Okay, I think that's a good point. Um, secondly, it's aging population. And the stuff with the aging population relates to their one-child policy. Okay, which have essentially, you know, led China to, uh, I mean, pretty much a demographic crisis, to be very honest with you, right? And, you know, this is marked by a declining labor force and an increasing aging population. The replacement rate, the replacement rate in terms of, you know, individuals who are retiring 
and individuals who are replacing them in the labor force is completely negative. And, you know, this this is definitely due to the fact that they have this one-child policy. Um, another thing to highlight here, the debt levels in China right now, right, in regards to, you know, corporate debt and public debt, I mean, it's just completely unhealthy, right? I mean, you have environmental concerns, right, um, relating from their, uh, their rapid industrialization, okay? You have trade tensions, you know, particularly with us here in the U.S., right? And I can tell you this for sure, China definitely doesn't want to be our enemy moving forward as they navigate this deflationary state, okay? So, like, you, you have a bunch of things fucking with China right now. And, you know, of course, Adam, I want you to expound on this. I mean, you're, mon you're more knowledgeable on this than I am, so definitely want you to expand on this and let's talk about it. <clears throat> no, you're... You're right. They, so, yeah, with China, they, they've hit the law of diminishing returns with their infrastructure and investment side. I mean, I think that's clear at this point. Their banks are drowning in toxic debt. Non-performing loans are rising. Their local governments, their municipalities. So Beijing kind of controls the whole thing, but it's, you know, the local governments also have their own debt, uh, and it, it's gotten bad. They depended on a lot of their revenue from land sales for property, since that's tanked. We're seeing them now do things. Um, you can even Google this. Uh, the local government municipality provinces in China, they began doing uh, taxes. Like there was a um, a uh, restaurant in China that got fined seven hundred dollars U.S. dollars for having a certain meal prepared a certain way. I mean, th th so that's essentially a subsidy, right? You're taking money from the household sector, making the problem worse, and you're diverting it to the government. But what is the government doing with the money? They're, you know, you, you can't, they're already hoarding reserves. They have three trillion in uh, dollar reserves and they have bonds, et cetera, U.S. bonds, because they got to park it. They need the yield. I mean, what are you going to do? Just sit on a bunch of cash? Like, nobody does that, right? You, uh, bonds are for rich people. It's money for rich people. And and the thing is that that's also a bullshit number. Look at their balance of payments, their chronic surplus. That number hasn't changed, by the way, their reserves in almost a decade. But if you actually look at their balance of payments, I would assume, from my own analysis, they probably are sitting on five, six trillion U.S. dollars within their banking system. Uh, either it's the shadow banks or the state banks that they're offloading them to. I mean, there's no way it's just three trillion. I mean, you can't run those big of chronic current account surplus and not have a massive amount of money. And it, it's a problem because if they go to war with the U.S. or today, I don't know if you saw on the news, they were saying BRICS is thinking about starting their own currency. God, I am so sick of hearing that because if you cut out, look at, let's look up, let's be real what BRICS is. And China is the, the powerhouse in BRICS. So if they made a BRICS currency, it would essentially be tethered to China. The problem is all of BRICS. So you have Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, four to the five run current account surpluses. That means they depend on someone else like Europe, the West, et cetera, to get those deficits. You can't have you can't cut out the West and have them all run a surplus. It's mathematically impossible. So the, China, the only one of scale, let's say Russia, the second largest economy in BRICS, uh, or maybe it's India. They're tethered. India is a very poor country, by the way. Actually, India, their uh, their uh, was it their finance minister? He actually said they have no interest in doing a BRICS currency, and I don't blame them. Why the hell would they want to do that? Uh, it's, it's, it's a stupid idea for them. So they're going to tether themselves to China, a fading growth engine, and what, three stagnant commodity exporters in South Africa, Brazil, Russia? Like, it, it's just, it's, it's a silly concept because essentially China then would have to run deficits to absorb BRICS um, gluts, their, their surpluses. Does China want to do that? Probably not. I mean, they're clearly not, actually. If you look at their policies, they're, they're exporting more than importing by a wide margin right now. So I don't think they want to politically subsidize the rest of those countries. And I think that's the big problem, because if they go to war with the West, to your point, you're taking out one of the largest consumers of your excess goods. So you have two options in that situation. If you're running a current account surplus and global demand dries up and you don't have the demand at home, you either have massive deflation from stockpiled goods that aren't going anywhere, or two, rising unemployment. Well, obviously, those are both very politically 
hard pills to swallow. Uh, Vietnam recently, uh, Nike, Vietnam is one of the largest textile exporters in the world, for example. Nike told them, uh, hey, and Adidas, hey, hey, we're having to slow down. We need less food. Uh, I'm sorry, textiles. Like the demand is weakening. So Vietnam had two options. We can consume these products at home. Well, they can't because they don't have the purchasing power to do it. Or they had to choose rising unemployment. And they laid off 6,000 factory workers in Vietnam. And that's not a political good look. And that's kind of what China's in. Like, if you go to war with the West, you either have to spur your consumption, expand credit, force credit down the throat of the household somehow, persuade them when you're giving them the money to go out and spend. Because once, you know, the, the central banks and same with the Fed, like we learned this after 08, you can pump money into the economy. But if people are cautious or confidence is shot they're not going to go out and spend the money that's why qe was such a failure for so long right and we just lulled along because the consumers weren't borrowing same with japan it doesn't matter how much they ease they were the ones who started qe qe was essentially invented by the japanese and it didn't work because you can it's like pushing on a string it's called a liquidity trap you can fill these banks and give all the offer corporations tons of money but if there's no demand for the loans if the companies are instead actually paying down debt or being underwater, they're not taking out new debt. So it's it's essentially neuters uh, monetary policy, and China's running into that problem right now. Like they're they're trying to cut interest rates, they're trying to get the consumer to spend. But when you have a household sector that's significantly lagging relative to your investment sector, it's not something you can do overnight. You would have to totally rebalance. If they went to war with America, um, I mean, yeah, it'd, it'd be a fiasco for sure. I mean, I mean, it definitely would be awful. But it would hurt uh, China just as much as America. I mean, you see people say, oh, China's got a bunch of gold. You know, Russia, they're holding all this gold. Yeah, look at their real GDP per capita. Russia's is down 25% since 2015, right? It's like, what wealth? Like, you, okay, they have gold and no U.S. debt. And look at their currency. It's gone to shit. Like, they have no consumer in that economy. Same with, the, you know, South Africa and Brazil. Uh, China's is okay. India is... You know, it, it could be have potential. Hence, they don't want to peg themselves to China. So, like, hey, we're getting GDP. We're growing. Why the hell would we want to tether ourselves to you? Because if you make a BRICS currency in China, which is the largest economy, obviously, of BRICS, it, I'm assuming, like Germany was when the Europe, right? They built the ECB, the European Central Bank, off of the former German Bundesbank because it was the most stable and fastest growing economy. So, I'm assuming if they get a BRICS currency, they would have to tether it to the yuan. It'll, it'll be a dumb decision for India, right? Oh, yeah, and they said it. They literally said it. They're like, we have no interest in that whatsoever because yeah. let's did say you China know, did you know that India right now? India right now is forecasted to be the largest e e economy in the world by 2075. It could be. It, it, I mean, to me, China, I mean, India's been the golden goose that's never laid an egg, but it definitely has potential. I mean, it has far more potential going forward than China does, obviously, because they haven't even started uh, their infrastructure. They have very bad infrastructure in the economy, a very bad caste system. But if they wanted to, or maybe they'll try to fix it. I know they want to make the rupee more attractive or currency. I mean, there's no incentive for them to peg themselves to a fading growth engine and three stagnant commodity exporters. Because if China's slowing, let's say in theory, they're all pegged to each other. Let's just say BRICS makes a currency. Let's say China's slowing. China's like, all right, we're going to cut interest rates. But let's say India's running hot. They're growing. So by China cutting interest rates, that means they all have to cut interest rates, right? Because you're pegged. Otherwise, you'll break the peg. This is kind of what happened with Europe, right? Germany was good, but the pigs weren't. Germany was tightening, and the pigs, uh, the other, like Greece and them weren't. So that's the problem. You, you have these different economies, and you're trying to tether them to one. You all have to follow the one. And India would probably not want inflation and GDP running hot, kind of like what Turkey was doing right now, right? You don't want to be in that situation just because China is lagging. Or worse, let's say China is saying, we're running hot. We want to uh, raise interest rates. And let's say you're Brazil, and they're like, no, we're in a recession. What the hell? You're going to tighten interest rates? That means we have to tighten interest rates. And then you're going to sink us into a recession. So I just don't see it working. Europe has created a lot of problems, obviously. I just don't see BRICS doing that. So, yeah. A hundred percent, brother, without a doubt. By the way, guys, if you're enjoying this conversation, put a fire emoji in the chat right now. Put a fire emoji in the chat again. This is not a, you know, this is not a popcorn conversation, right? This is this is more of a let's get informed and let's have um an educational discussion, an educative discussion.
right? So put a fire emoji in the chat if you guys are enjoying it. Again, for you guys on Twitter, if you could retweet the space, that'll be awesome. For you guys on Clubhouse, if you could share the room to the hallway, ping some of your friends in the room, that'll also be awesome, right? So, um, I mean, one thing I definitely want us to discuss, Adam, and this is going back to the gentleman from earlier who just couldn't shut up, you know? Because <laughs> I mean, you got to follow the structure of the room, right? Now I want to talk about Japan, okay? Because now I want to talk about the Japanese lost decade. Right. And of course, to get everybody to understand that this would have been a perfect time for him to chime in in a discussion as opposed to earlier on. Right. So, um, I'll, you know what? Put a one in the chat if you guys understand what happened, you know, in Japan. Right. If you guys understand, you know, this term, the lost decade, you know, in its association with Japan. Put a one in the chat if you understand it. Put a five in the chat if, if you do not understand it. Um, and maybe put a zero in the chat if you just, you just you have little just little knowledge on that said topic, right? So just drop it in the chat real quick. And yes, to Kyla in the comments, this room will be available for for you to listen to later. The replays will be on, so you can definitely check it out. Wow, so it seems like a lot of people don't actually understand what happened. Um, so I guess Adam, I mean Adam, you, you want to take this or you want me to just uh just summarize it real quick yeah you could summarize it and then i can add in anything okay cool so you know the lost decade with japan essentially refers to um and honestly we're, we're talking about 20 plus years right in terms of um you know this this period of you know just completely negative things happening to the J japanese economy and um you know, you have certain things that cause this, right? So you had an asset price bubble. And, you know, just to, just to get you to understand what that means, you're talking about real estate in a sense, right? You're talking about real estate and you're talking about, you know, a catastrophic, you know, negative situation when the bubble actually burst, right? So for some of you guys in the room, you know, the first thing you're probably thinking about is 2008. Imagine 2008 on steroids for the Japanese real estate sector. OK, and, you know, this is something that completely, completely schmeckled. You know, I'm going to use Ray's word right now, schmeckle the Japanese economy. OK, and, you know, I definitely want Adam to talk a little bit about that specifically, because right now we've seen something similar, but of course, not not as huge as what happened in Japan with China and their property sector right now. But um, Adam, could you speak on that specifically? The asset price bubble and the, the burst of the bubble. Yeah, so Japan was, um, I think it was Jonathan earlier. I mean, he's right. I mean, that, this was the big fear back then, right? That Japan was taking over the world. All the goods were coming from Japan. It, it, it's, you know, these things, you know, history doesn't repeat, but it always rhymes, right? And this is kind of what we, we saw with Japan. Um, it started back with Bretton Woods. We all know at the U.S. one. Well, the Allies won World War II, the U.S. dollar dethroned the uh, pound sterling, the British pound sterling, as the reserve currency. And they pegged everything. So imagine like an upside-down pyramid where you have the very tip of the pyramid is gold-backed and the rest was dollar-backed. So when you have everything pegged to gold, you have to peg these currencies to parity. And they, it's very difficult to do that right because you're if you over peg a currency you're going to constrict them um if you under peg a currency meaning weaken it you're going to create a massive uh, surge in their economy exports um they're going to grow rapidly because you're they're artificially cheap well the japanese yen was pegged over 300 yen to the u.s dollar and uh, the west germany same thing and it's no surprise both of them boomed obviously they were bombed to hell so they had to rebuild their uh, manufacturing capacity and it was m much more modern since it was you know a lot of the u.s in detroit and everything were still using 1920s early 1930s productive capacity but um yeah so they boomed they they had a very favorable peg and china I, i'm sorry japan west germany two those two main guys players were running huge surpluses they were exporting a lot and they were growing because when you're exporting you're getting in dollar inflows and those dollars had to find somewhere to go they were buying u.s real estate they were buying real estate all over the world and the problem with it is so in 1985 
this is where the beginning of the end came. Reagan essentially told him, like, listen, by us having the U.S. dollar was way too strong at that point. I mean, uh, this was after the inflation of the 70s, Volcker hiked interest rates. The U.S. dollar was just a wrecking ball at this point as a free floating currency. And they told Japan, said, hey, listen, we are, you know, and Trump did the same thing with China. Uh, he was like, we have an unfair competitive tra- uh, advantage with, uh, I'm sorry, you have uh, a greater competitive advantage with us. You're keeping the yen cheap 